Chapter nineteen of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter nineteen. London from April till September, eighteen twenty two. Pelletier, Literary Labours meeting with hangon our walks a night in westminster abbey pelletier the author of domine salvum flac regum and chief editor of the acte des apotres continued in london what he had begun in paris he was not precisely a man of vice but he was eaten up by a vermin of smaller defects from which it was impossible to cleanse him he was a libertine a spendthrift getting a great deal of money and wasting it on his pleasures at the same time the slave of legitimacy and ambassador of king christophe to george the third diplomatic correspondent of the count de limonade and consuming in champagne the salary paid him in sugar this ghost of a monsieur violet playing the grand airs of the revolution on a pocket fiddle came as a breton to offer me his services i mentioned to him the plan of my essay of which he strongly approved it will be magnificent said he and immediately recommended me to take rooms near bayliss his printer who would print the work secretly and according as it was written de boff the bookseller was to manage its sale and he pelletier would trumpet its praise in his journal the ambigu whilst notice of it might be taken in the courrier francais in london of which m de montlosier had just become editor pelletier entertained no doubts he spoke of obtaining for me the cross of saint louis for my share in the siege of thionville my gilles blas tall thin and rough-looking with powdered hair and bald forehead continually gesticulating put on his round hat took me by the arm and conducted me to bayliss the printers where without more ado he engaged a lodging for me at a guinea a month i was now in full sight of the golden future but upon what plank was i to cross the present Pelletti procured for me translations from latin and english at these i laboured all day and at night on the essay historique into which i worked up portions of my travels and my reveries Bayliss furnished me with books, and I very unseasonably laid out a few shillings on the purchase of some old volumes exhibited on the stalls. Hangon, whom I met with on board the Jersey packet, had kept up an intercourse with me. He was engaged in literature, a savant who secretly wrote novels, the pages of which he used to read to me. He lodged very near Bayliss's at the bottom of a street running into Hoban. I breakfasted with him every morning at ten o'clock. We talked over politics, and particularly about my works. I told him how much I had built of my nightly edifice, the essay, and then I returned to my work by day, the translations. We met again for dinner at an eating-house at a shilling a head. Afterwards we betook ourselves to the fields. Often also we walked alone, for both of us liked to give way to our dreams. On those occasions I directed my course to Kensington or Westminster. Kensington was very agreeable to me. I wandered about in its retired spots, whilst a part of the gardens towards Hyde Park was crowded with a brilliant throng the contrast between my poverty and their riches my forlornness and their numbers was agreeable to me to contemplate i saw young english ladies passing in the distance with a feeling of that delightful confusion formerly inspired by my sophide when after i had adorned her with all the suggestions of my passion i scarcely dared to raise my eyes to my own work death to which i believed myself drawing near added a mystery to the vision of a world from which i had almost departed was the look ever cast upon the stranger seated at the foot of a pine-tree had any of those beautiful women an idea of the invisible presence of rene westminster was another lounge amidst the labyrinth of the tombs i thought upon my own just about to open was the bust of an unknown man like myself ever to be placed among such illustrious statues next the sepulchres of monarchs presented themselves to my eyes neither cromwell nor charles i was to be found amongst the number the ashes of robert d'artois a traitor reposed under the flags trodden by my loyal feet a destiny similar to that of charles i had just befallen louis the sixteenth every day the iron was reaping its harvest in france and the graves of my kindred were already dug the chapel service and the conversations of strangers interrupted my reflections it was inconvenient frequently to repeat my visits for i was obliged to give the watchmen of those who were no longer alive the shilling which was necessary for my own subsistence outside the abbey indeed i whirled about freely with the rooks and stopped to examine the towers twins of unequal size glowing under the rays of the setting sun above the dark covering of london smoke 
on one occasion however it happened that from an earnest desire to view the interior of the temple at the decline of day i forgot myself in admiration of the architecture so full of boldness and caprice overwhelmed by a feeling of the sombre vastness of the christian churches montaigne i kept wandering about till i was overtaken by night the doors were closed i tried to find a way out called for the usher and knocked at the gates all this noise spread about and wasted in the silence proved of no avail and i was obliged to rest among the dead after some hesitation in the choice of my lair i stopped near the monument of lord chatham at the bottom of the gallery of the chapel of the knights and that of henry the seventh at the entrance to the steps leading to the aisle shut in by folding gates a tomb fixed in the wall and opposite a marble figure of death with a scythe furnished me a shelter a fold in the marble winding-sheet served me as a niche after the example of charles v i habituated myself to my interment i was in the most favourable position to see the world such as it is what an amount of greatness shut up under these domes what now remains of it sorrows are not less vain than joys there is no difference between the unfortunate lady jane grey and the fortunate alice of salisbury her skeleton only is less horrible because it is without a head her body derives its ornament from her punishment and the absence of that which constituted her beauty the tourneys of the conquerors at cressy or the games of the field of the cloth of gold of henry the eighth will not be reopened in this theatre of funereal pomp bacon newton and milton rest in as profound repose and are as much past for ever as the most obscure of their contemporaries would i a poor wandering exile consent no longer to be the poor forgotten pitiful thing i am in order to be one of these renowned and powerful dead sated with the pleasures of life life is something more than all that if from the shores of this world we do not distinctly discern things divine let us not be astonished time is a veil interposed between our eyes and the light of eternity sheltered under my marble sheet my mind returned from these high thoughts to the simple impressions of the time and place my anxiety mingled with pleasure was like that which i used to feel in my turret at combourg when listening to the wind a blast and a shadow are things of a similar nature accustoming myself to the obscurity by degrees i obtained a glimpse of the figures placed on the tombs i examined the corbels of the saint denis of england from whence it might be said that past events and the years which have been descended in gothic lampadaries the whole edifice a monolith temple of petrified ages i counted ten eleven by the clock the hammer which rose and fell upon the bronze was the only moving thing with me in these regions besides this there was nothing to be heard but the distant rolling of a carriage or the watchman's call these distant sounds of the earth came to me from one world to another the fog from the thames and the coal smoke from the surrounding city slowly penetrated into the temple and spread around a second darkness at length a ray of twilight appeared in a corner of the deeper shadows i looked with fixed attention at the growing progress of the light did it emanate from the two sons of edward the fourth murdered by their uncle thus lay the gentle babes thus girdling one another within their alabaster innocent arms their lips were four red roses on a stalk which in their summer beauty kissed each other shakespeare god did not send me these melancholy and charming souls but the light phantom of a woman scarcely arrived at maturity carrying a light protected by a sheet of paper folded in the form of a shell this was the girl to ring the bells i heard the sound of a kiss and a bell proclaimed the dawn the girl was struck with terror when i passed out along with her through the door of the cloisters i related to her my adventure and she told me that she had come to do her father's duty as he was ill not a word of the kiss End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty london from april till september eighteen twenty two distress unexpected aid lodging overlooking a cemetery new comrades in misfortune our pleasures my cousin de la boetardie the story of my adventure amused angle and we formed a plan of being shut up in the abbey but our miseries called us to the abode of death in a less poetical manner my funds were exhausted bailiffs and above having received a security for reimbursement in case of loss had ventured to commence the printing of the essay at this point their generosity ended and nothing was more natural than that it should i am even surprised at their boldness translations were no longer forthcoming 
but pelletier who was a man of pleasure became tired of continuous kindness he would have given me what he had had he not preferred laying it out on his own appetites but to seek for opportunities of labour here and there and patiently to follow up any good work was to him impossible Angon also saw his means melting away daily sixty francs constituted the whole resources of both we lessened our rations as is done in a ship when the voyage is unexpectedly prolonged instead of dining at a shilling a head we only spent half that sum at our breakfast we retrenched the half of our bread and dispensed altogether with butter this kind of abstinence affected my friend's nerves his mind wandered he listened appeared as if he heard some one in reply he burst out into laughter or shed tears Angant was a believer in animal magnetism, and his brains were full of the reveries of Swedenborg. He told me in the morning that there had been great noises about him during the night, and was annoyed if I threw any doubt upon his fancies. The anxiety which he caused me prevented me from feeling my own sufferings. These sufferings were, however, great. A very meagre diet and continuous labour increased the pain in my chest. I began to feel difficulty in walking, and yet I spent the whole of the day and a part of the night out of doors, in order that no one might be aware of my destitution when we came to our last shilling i agreed with my friend to keep it in order to make a show of breakfasting we arranged that we would buy a twopenny loaf that we should have the breakfast things laid as usual the hot water brought up and the tea caddy set on the table that we would not put in any tea and not eat any bread but merely drink some water flavoured by a few crumbs of sugar remaining at the bottom of the basin five days passed away in this manner I was devoured by hunger, felt on fire, and sleep had forsaken me. I was accustomed to suck pieces of linen dipped in water, and to chew grass and paper. On passing by a baker's shop the torment was horrible. On a coarse winter's evening I have remained as long as two hours, standing before a grocer's shop or Italian warehouse, devouring with my eyes everything I saw. I would have eaten not merely the eatables, but the boxes, bags, or baskets which contained them. On the morning of the fifth day, ready to drop down from inanition, I dragged myself along to Angon's lodging. I knocked at his door, which remained shut, and called, without for some time receiving any reply. At length Angon rose and opened the door. He smiled with a wandering air. His coat was closed buttoned up. He sat down at the breakfast-table. "'Our breakfast is just coming,' said he, with an extraordinary voice. I thought I saw some drops of blood on his shirt, and proceeded quickly to unbutton his coat. He had inflicted a wound two inches deep on his left breast with a penknife. I called for help, and the maid-servant ran to fetch a surgeon. The wound proved dangerous. This new misfortune obliged me to interfere. Angon, a council of the Parliament of Brittany, had refused to receive the allowance granted by the English government to French magistrates, just as I also had refused to accept the shilling a day doled out as alms to the émigrés. I wrote to M. de Barentin, and made him acquainted with my friend's condition. Angon's relations hastened to his aid and removed him to the country. At this very time my uncle de Bede sent me a hundred and twenty francs, an affecting remembrance for my persecuted family. I felt as if I had before me all the gold of Peru, the might of the prisoners of France supported the French exile. My miseries interrupted my work, and as I sent no more copy, the printing was suspended. Deprived of Angon's company, I no longer kept my lodging at a guinea a month at Bailis's. I paid for the time expired and went elsewhere below the indigent emigres who had at first acted as patrons to me in london there were others more needy still there are degrees in poverty as well as in riches one may go from the man who in winter keeps himself warm with his dog down to him who shivers in patched rags my friends found me a lodging better suited to my decreasing means and installed me in a garret in marylebone street the small window of which opened on a burying ground Every night at the watchman's rattle gave notice of the approach of persons engaged in stealing the bodies of the dead. I had the consolation of knowing that Angon was out of danger. My comrades came to visit me in my workshop. For my independence and our poverty we might have been taken for painters seated on the ruins of Rome. We were artists in misery on the ruins of France. My figure served as a model and my bed as a seat for my pupils. This bed consisted of a mattress and coverlid. I had no sheets. When it was cold, my coat and a chair added to my covering kept me warm. Too weak to make my bed, it remained as God had made it for me. My cousin La Boetade, driven out of an Irish lodging-house for non-payment, although he had pledged his violin for the purpose, came to seek at my humble lodging a shelter from the constable. A Barbreton vicar lent him a mat for a bed. La Boetade, as well as Angon, was a council of parliament in Brittany, and yet he did not possess a pocket-handkerchief to tie round his head but he had deserted with arms and baggage, that is, he had carried away his square cap and red cloak. 
and now he lay under the purple at my side being witty and a good musician with a fine voice when we failed to fall asleep he sat up quite naked upon his mat sung ballads and accompanied himself on a guitar which had only three strings one night when the poor fellow was warbling forth metastasio's hymn to venus shendi propitia he was exposed to a draught his mouth was turned and he died but not immediately for i rubbed his cheeks with all my might we were accustomed to take counsel together in our lofty chamber to discuss politics and to talk over all the noisy complaints of the emigres in the evenings we went to join the dance at the lodgings of our aunts or cousins after their dressmaking was over or the hats finished End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty one london from april till september eighteen twenty two sumptuous entertainment end of my hundred and twenty francs fresh distress taube dot bishops dinner at the london tavern camden papers those who read this part of my memoirs will not have perceived that i have twice interrupted them once to give a grand dinner to the duke of york the king's brother and again to give an entertainment on the anniversary of the french king's entry into paris on his restoration july the eighth this entertainment cost me forty thousand francs peers and peeresses of the british empire ambassadors and foreigners of distinction filled my splendid saloons my table glittered with magnificent glass and sevres china the most recherche viands wines and flowers were in abundance portland place was crowded with brilliant equipages collinet and the band of almacs charmed the fashionably melancholy dandies and the dreamily elegant ladies pensively dancing to its music the opposition and the ministerial majority had agreed to a truce lady canning chatted with lord londonderry lady jersey with the duke of wellington monsieur who in eighteen twenty two complimented me on my splendid entertainment was quite unconscious in seventeen ninety three that not far from him existed a future minister who while awaiting his coming grandeur fasted for his sin of fidelity in his miserable garret overlooking a graveyard i congratulate myself now on having experienced shipwreck tasted the hardships of war and shared the privations of the humblest class of society as i do on having in my days of prosperity met with injustice and calumny i have profited by these lessons life is but a child's plaything without the evils which render it of weight and importance i was the man of the hundred and twenty francs but equality of fortune not having yet been established and provisions not having fallen in price there was nothing to form a counterpoise to my purse which became lighter every day i could not reckon on any fresh assistance from my family exposed as they were in brittany to the double scourge of chouannerie and the reign of terror i saw no alternative before me but the hospital or the thames some of the domestics of emigres who could no longer maintain servants had transformed themselves into restaurateurs to maintain their masters strange cheer was there at these tab dot and strange politics all the victories of the republic were transformed into defeats and if any one ventured to doubt on the subject of an immediate restoration he was instantly cried out upon as a jacobin two old bishops who looked as if they were not far from the brink of the grave were walking one spring day in st james's park sir said the one do you think we shall be in france in the month of june why sir replied the other after mature reflection i see nothing to prevent it the man of resources pelletier came to dislodge me from my eyrie he had read in a yarmouth newspaper that a society of antiquaries were going to undertake a history of suffolk and were in want of a frenchman capable of deciphering the french manuscripts of the twelfth century which were among the camden papers the minister or parson of beckles was at the head of the undertaking and it was to him that any application must be made here is just what we'll do for you said pelletier be off directly you can decipher these dusty old papers you will continue to send copy for the essay to bayliss and i will make the fellow go on with the printing you will return to london with two hundred guineas in your pocket and your work done and then let the world go as it will i began to stammer out some objections eh diable interrupted he do you mean to stay in this paradise where i am already nearly killed with cold if rivarol champonettes mirabeau tonneau and myself had been so bashful we should have made fine work in the Actes des apotres 
do you know that this story of Angelon and yourself makes an infernal noise? You meant to let yourselves die of hunger, did you? Ah, ah, poo, ah, ah. And Pelletier, bent double, held his knees for laughing. He had just got rid of a hundred copies of his newspaper to the colonies, had got paid for them, and his guineas jingled in his pocket. He forcibly carried me off with the apoplectic La Buetade and two other tattered emigres who happened to be in the way to dine at the London Tavern, and there treated us with roast beef, plum pudding, and port wine to our satisfaction. Monsieur le Comte, said he to my cousin, how did you get your neck all on one side in that way? La Buetade, half shocked, half pleased, explained it to the best of his power and told that he had been suddenly attacked while singing the words o bella venere my poor paralytic cousin had such a dead benumbed miserable air while stammering out his bella venere that pelletier fell back in a wild fit of laughing and nearly overturned the table by kicking it below with both his feet on reflection the advice of my countryman a true follower and imitator of my other countryman le sage did not appear to me to be neglected in three days after making various inquiries and getting myself respectably clothed by pelletier's tailor i set out for beckles with some money lent me by de boff on my promise of going on with the essay i changed my name unpronounceable by any englishman to that of combourg which had been borne by my brother and which recalled to my mind the pains and pleasures of my early youth i alighted at the inn and thence went to present myself to the minister of the place and deliver to him a letter from de boff who was much esteemed in the english book trade in which i was recommended as a savant of the first order i was extremely well received saw all the gentlemen of the county and met with two officers of the french navy who were giving lessons in french in the neighbourhood end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty two london from april till september eighteen twenty two my occupations in the country death of my brother misfortunes of my family two frances letters from angle i began to recover strength the rides which i took in some degree restored me to health the scenery of england seen thus in detail was pleasing but rather melancholy in character everywhere the same objects the same views m de combourg was invited to all parties it was to study that i owed the first alleviation of my lot cicero was right in recommending literature as a resource to the mind in the sorrows of life the ladies were delighted to meet a frenchman that they might have an opportunity of speaking french the misfortunes of my family which i learned from the newspapers and which were the cause of discovering my real name for i could not conceal my grief increased the interest taken in me by the society in which i moved the public prints announced the death of m de malesherbes that of his daughter the president de rosambo's wife that of his granddaughter the countess de chateaubriand and of her husband my brother sacrificed together on the same scaffold on the same day and at the same hour m de malesherbes was an object of admiration and veneration to the english my family connection with this champion of louis the sixteenth increased the goodwill of my host towards me my uncle de bedet sent me accounts of the persecution experienced by the other members of my family my aged and incomparable mother had been thrown into a cart in company with other victims and carried from her retreat in brittany to the jails of paris to share the fate of the son she had so deeply loved my wife and my sister lucile were awaiting their sentence in the dungeons of rennes it had been proposed to imprison them in the chateau of combourg now turned into a state prison their innocence was charged with the crime of my emigration what were our sufferings in a foreign land when compared with those of our countrymen who had remained in their own country and yet what an additional misery amidst the other hardships of exile to know that that very exile has been made a pretext for the persecution of those dear to us two years ago my sister-in-law's wedding ring was found in the gutter of the rue cassette and brought to me it was broken but the two hoops hung twisted together the names engraved on them were still perfectly legible how had this ring again come to light where and when had it been lost had the victim imprisoned in the luxembourg passed along the rue cassette on her way to execution had she let the ring fall from the cart or had it been taken from her lifeless finger after her death i was deeply affected at the sight of this broken ring with its still legible inscription it brought vividly to my mind the recollection of so cruel a fate something mysterious and fatal seemed attached to this ring sent as it were from the habitations of the dead 
in memory of her and of my brother i gave it to her son may it not bring misfortune on him cher orphelin image de ta mère au ciel pour toi je demande ici bas les jeux heureux retranchés à ton père et les enfants que ton oncle n'a pas this and two or three other bad stanzas were the only wedding present which i was able to make to my nephew when he married one other monument of these misfortunes is in my possession i give the letter written to me by m de contencin who in searching among the archives of paris found the order of the revolutionary tribunal which sent my brother and his family to the scaffold m le vicomte there is a sort of cruelty in reviving in a mind which has suffered deeply the recollection of the misfortunes which have so painfully affected it this feeling made me hesitate for some time to offer you a very melancholy document which came into my hands during my historical researches it is a death warrant signed before his own decease by a man who always showed himself as implacable as death itself towards any in whom he found rank and virtue united i hope you will not be displeased with me for adding to your family archives a document reviving such painful images i supposed it would have an interest in your eyes because it had value in mine and it immediately occurred to me to offer it to you if i have not been indiscreet i shall be doubly happy inasmuch as this step affords me an opportunity of expressing the sentiments of profound respect and sincere admiration with which you have long inspired me and with which i am your very humble and obedient servant a de contencin hotel de la prefecture de la seine paris march twenty third eighteen thirty five i replied as follows sir i had caused search to be made in the sainte chapelle for the documents relating to the trial of my unfortunate brother and of his wife but the order which you have had the kindness to send me was not found among them this order and many others with their erasures and their ill-written names must surely have been presented to fouquier at the supreme tribunal he would know the signature well and yet these are the times looked back upon in the present day with regret and praise to the skies and volumes of eulogium for myself i envy my brother it has been his fortune to be long since set free from this miserable world i thank you sincerely for the sentiments you express in your good and noble letter and beg you to be assured of the high esteem with which i am etc etc this death warrant is especially remarkable for the evidence it affords of the levity with which murders were committed some names are wrong spelled others are effaced but these defects in form which would in justice have sufficed to annul the simplest sentence arrested not the bloody executioners they were only careful to attend to the precise hour of death at five o'clock precisely i give a faithful copy of the authentic document executioners of criminal sentences revolutionary tribunal the executioner of criminal sentences will not fail to go to the prison of the conciergerie there to put into execution the sentence which condemns mousset depremenil chapelier touré l amoignant malzerbe the woman le pelletier rosambo chateaubriand and his wife the proper name is effaced and illegible the widow du chatelet the wife of grammont formerly duke the woman rochoir and parmentier fourteen to the punishment of death the execution will take place to-day at five o'clock precisely on the place de la revolution in this town the public prosecutor h q fouquier given at the tribunal the third florial in the second year of the republic two conveyances the ninth of thermidor saved my mother's life but she was forgotten at the conciergerie the commissary of the convention found her there what are you doing here citoyen said he who are you why do you remain here my mother replied that having lost her son she cared not what was passing beyond her prison walls and that it was matter of indifference to her whether she died in the prison or elsewhere but perhaps you have other children replied the commissary my mother named my wife and sisters confined in the dungeons of rennes an order for their liberation was sent off and my mother was sent out of the prison a great omission has been made in every history of the revolution side by side with the delineation of interior france should have been traced one of exterior france a picture of that great colony of exiles varying its industry and its sufferings with the diversities of climate and the differences of national manners without france all was effected by individual effort state changes obscure afflictions silent unrewarded sacrifices and one fixed idea preserved in the minds of this variety of individuals of every rank age and sex old france wandering on the face of the earth with its prejudices and its faithful adherents as in ancient times the church of god with its virtues and its martyrs within france all was effected by the efforts of the masses barrere announcing murders and conquests civil wars and foreign wars 
the gigantic combats in la vendee and on the banks of the rhine thrones crumbling at the tread of our armies our fleets engulfed in the waves the people disinterring the monarchs at st denis and blinding living beings with the dust of their dead predecessors new france glorying in her fresh liberty proud even of her crimes firm on her own territory although enlarging her boundaries doubly armed with the executioner's axe and the soldier's sword amidst my grief for the misfortunes of my own family i received letters from my friend angon which at least reassured me on the subject of his fate the letters were very remarkable ones he wrote in the month of september seventeen ninety five your letter of the twenty third of august is full of the most touching sensibility i have shown it to several persons whose eyes filled with tears on reading it i was almost tempted to say to them what diderot said on the day when j j rousseau came to weep in his prison at vincennes see how my friends love me my illness was in reality only one of those nervous fevers which give one a great deal of suffering and for which time and patience are the best remedies during my illness i read extracts from the phaedo and timaeus these books give one a desire to die and i said like cato it must be so plato thou reasonest well i pictured to myself my journey to the shades as one would imagine a journey to the indies i thought i should see many new objects in the world of spirits as swedenborg calls it and above all should be exempt from the fatigues and dangers of travel End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole Lee, memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty three london from april till september eighteen twenty two charlotte four leagues from beckles in the small town of bungay lived the rev mr a clergyman of the church of england remarkable for his knowledge of greek and mathematics his family consisted of his wife still young and agreeable in person mind and manners and an only daughter about fifteen having been introduced to the family i was better received there than anywhere else we drank after the old english fashion and remained two hours at table after the departure of the ladies mr who had been in america took great delight in relating his travels and listening to accounts of mine as well as in conversing about newton and homer his daughter who had become learned in order to gratify him was an excellent musician and sang as well as madame pasta does now she appeared again at tea and charmed away the infectious drowsiness of the old clergyman leaning on the end of the piano i listened to her in silence when the music was finished the young lady questioned me about france and about literature she asked me for plans of study was particularly anxious to become acquainted with the italian authors and begged me to give her some readings and remarks on the divina commedia and the gerusalemme by degrees i felt the timid charm of an attachment proceeding from the soul i had decked out my floridans but i could not have ventured to pick up this lady's glove i was embarrassed when i attempted to translate a passage in tasso while much more at ease with the chaster and more masculine genius of dante we were relatively of suitable ages there is always something melancholy in those attachments which are not formed till middle life if persons do not meet in the prime of youth the recollections of the person beloved are not mixed up with those years when one has lived without knowing her those days which belong to other associations are painful to the memory and cut off as it were from our existence is there a disproportion in age inconveniences are increased the elder has begun life before the younger was born the younger is destined to remain alone in turn one has lived in a solitude on this side the cradle the other will pass through a solitude beyond a tomb the past has been a desert to the former the future will prove a desert to the latter it is difficult to love with all the conditions of happiness youth beauty suitable time and harmony of heart taste character graces and years having had a fall from my horse i remained for some time at mr s house it was winter the dreams of my life began to fade away before reality miss became more reserved she ceased to bring me flowers she was not disposed to sing had any one told me that i should pass the remainder of my life unknown in the bosom of this retired family i should have died with pleasure nothing is wanting to love but continuance to be at once eden before the fall and hosanna without end grant that beauty remains that youth does not decay and that the heart never wearies and you reproduce heaven 
love is so completely the sovereign happiness that it is haunted by the desire of being eternal it pronounces no oaths but those which are irrevocable if joys fail it seeks to eternize its sorrows a fallen angel love still continues to use the language which it employed in its incorruptible sojourn its hope is never to cease in its double nature and double illusions here below it aims at perpetuation by immortal thoughts and endless generations with dread i saw the moment approaching when i should be obliged to withdraw on the evening of the day announced for my departure the dinner was gloomy to my great astonishment mr withdrew with his daughter at the dessert and i was left alone with his wife she became extremely embarrassed i thought she was going to reproach me for an attachment which she had discovered but of which i had never spoken she looked at me cast down her eyes and blushed she was extremely attractive in her embarrassment and there is no sentiment of tenderness which she might not have inspired herself at length making a great effort to overcome the feeling which deprived her of speech sir said she in english you have seen my embarrassment i do not know whether charlotte is agreeable to you but it is impossible to deceive a mother and my daughter certainly has become attached to you mr and myself have considered the matter you are in all respects agreeable to us we believe you would make our daughter happy you have no country you have just lost your relations your property is sold what then can recall you to france till you inherit our property you shall live with us of all the distress i have experienced that was the most sensible and the greatest i threw myself at mrs s knees i covered her hands with my kisses and tears she thought these were tears of joy and she began to sob from pleasure she put out her hand to ring the bell called for her husband and her daughter stop i cried i am married she fainted i went out and without going to my room again left the house on foot i reached beckles and after having written a letter to mrs of which i regret not having kept a copy i posted off to london i have ever retained the most agreeable most tender and most grateful recollection of this event before my renown mr s was the only family which took an interest in my well-being and received me with true kindness poor unknown proscribed without attraction or beauty there was presented to me the prospect of a happy future a country a delightful wife to rescue me from my forlorn condition a mother almost as beautiful to take the place of my aged mother and a father well informed amiable and attached to learning to replace him of whom heaven had deprived me what had i as compensation for all that there could be no illusion in their choice of me i had a right to believe myself beloved since that time i have only met with one attachment sufficiently exalted to inspire me with the same confidence as to the interest which i may have appeared afterwards to excite i have never been able to discover whether external causes the voice of fame the splendour of condition the eclat of high literary or political positions were not the attractions which drew towards me admiration and zeal moreover by marrying charlotte my whole character in life would have been changed buried in an english county i should have become a country gentleman not a single line would have ever fallen from my pen i should even have forgotten my language for i was accustomed to write in english or i began to think also in english would my country have lost much by my disappearance if i could lay aside what has consoled me i would say that i might have reckoned already many days of calm instead of those of trouble which have fallen to my lot what would the empire the restoration the divisions and quarrels of france have been to me i should not have been obliged every morning to palliate faults and to combat errors is it certain that i have any real talents and that these talents have been worth the sacrifice of my life will my memory survive my tomb and should it do so will there be after the transformations effected in a world changed and occupied with other things will there be a public to listen to me shall i not be like a man of former times unintelligible to the new generations will not my ideas my feelings and even my style be things wearisome and obsolete to a scornful posterity will my shade be able to say as that of virgil to dante poeta fui et cantai i was a poet and have sung return to london when returned to london i was unable to find any repose i had fled before my destiny as a malefactor before his crime how painful must it have been for a family so worthy of my homage respect and gratitude to have experienced a kind of refusal from a man unknown whom they had hospitably received 
and to whom they had offered a new home with a simplicity and an absence of suspicion and precaution characteristic of the manners of the patriarchal times i continually dwelt on the vexation of charlotte and the just reproaches to which i might be and ought to be subjected for in fact i had gratified myself by indulging an inclination which i knew to be unlawful was this then really a deceitful attempt vaguely made to gain a lady's affections without reflecting on my blamable conduct but either by stopping as i did in order to remain an honourable man or by passing over the obstacle in order to give myself up to a desire condemned beforehand by my conduct i must have plunged the object of my deceit into regret or sorrow from these painful reflections i allowed myself to indulge in others not less full of bitterness i cursed my marriage which according to the false suggestions of a mind at that time highly morbid had obstructed my true way in life and deprived me of happiness i did not consider that on account of the lowness of spirits to which i was subject and the romantic notions of liberty which i cherished a marriage with miss would have been as painful to me as a union more independent one thing remained pure and delightful within me although profoundly sad the image of charlotte that image eventually overruled my rebellious feelings against my lot i was a hundred times tempted to go back to bungay not with a view to present myself to the afflicted family but to conceal myself by the roadside to see charlotte pass to follow her to the temple where we had the same god if not the same altar and to offer to that woman through the medium of heaven the inexpressible ardour of my wishes in order to pronounce at least in thought the prayer of nuptial benediction which i might have heard from the mouth of a minister in his temple wandering from resolution to resolution i wrote long letters to charlotte which i immediately afterwards tore to pieces a few insignificant notes which i had received from her were regarded by me like a talisman ever present to me in thought charlotte beautiful and tender followed purifying my steps by the paths of the Safide. she absorbed all my faculties she was the centre through which the whole of my intellectual nature passed as the blood passes through the heart everything became distasteful to me for i was constantly drawing a comparisons to her advantage a genuine and unfortunate passion is a poisonous leaven which remains in the depths of the soul and would spoil the bread of angels the places where i had walked the hours which i had passed and the words which i had exchanged with charlotte were all engraven on my memory i saw the smile of the wife who had been destined for me i touched her dark hair with a feeling of respect i pressed her beautiful arms to my breast like a chain of lilies which i might have worn round my neck i was no sooner in a retired place than charlotte with her fair hands placed herself at my side i felt her presence as one breathes by night the perfume of unseen flowers deprived of the society of Angon, my walks became more lonely than ever and gave me full liberty to conjure up the image of charlotte there is not a heath a road a church within thirty miles of london which i have not visited the most retired places a bank of nettles or a ditch full of thistles every place which seemed neglected by man became to me preferred and in these places byron already breathed with my head resting on my hand i contemplated these despised localities when the painful impression which they produced affected me too much the remembrance of charlotte intervened to turn everything to rapture i was then like the pilgrim who when arrived at a solitary place within sight of the rocks of sinai heard the nightingale's song in london people were surprised at my ways i looked at no one i never made any answer i knew not what was said my old companion suspected i was touched with madness extraordinary meeting what happened at bungay after my departure what became of the family into which i had carried joy and mourning always bear carefully in mind that i am now an ambassador at the court of george the fourth and that i am writing in london in eighteen twenty two what took place in london in seventeen ninety five some matters of business have prevented me for eight days from continuing the narrative which i now resume during this interval my valet de chambre came one morning between twelve and one o'clock to inform me that a carriage had stopped at my door and that an english lady asked to speak with me as i made it a rule in my public situation to refuse an interview to none i desired the lady to be shown up i was in my library the lady was announced and i saw a person in deep mourning enter the room she was accompanied by two beautiful boys of about the respective ages of sixteen and fourteen also in mourning i advanced to meet the stranger she was so affected that she was scarcely able to walk she said in an almost inarticulate voice my lord do you remember me yes i recognised miss the years which had passed over her head had still left spring there i took her by the hand made her sit down and seated myself by her side 
I was unable to speak, my eyes filled with tears, and through these tears I looked at her in silence. By all that I experienced I felt how deeply I had loved her. At length I recovered the power of speaking in my turn. And you, madam, do you remember me? She raised her eyes, which she had cast down, and the only answer was a look, smiling and melancholy, as a long remembrance. Her hand was still in mine. She said to me, I am in mourning for my mother. My father has been dead for several years. These are my children. As she said these last words, she withdrew her hand, sunk into her armchair, and covered her eyes with her handkerchief. She soon resumed. My lord, I speak to you now in the language which I tried with you at Bungay. I am confused. Pardon me. My children are the sons of Admiral, to whom I was married about three years after your departure from England. But at present I have not self-possession enough to enter into details. Allow me to come again. I asked her address, and offered her my arm to conduct her back to her carriage. She trembled, and I pressed her hand to my heart. The next day I called on Lady, and found her alone. Then there began between us that series of Do You Remembers, which recall a whole life. At each, do you remember, we looked at each other. We tried to discover in our faces those traces of time which furnish a cruel measurement of the distance from the point of departure, and the length of the way which has been passed. I said to Charlotte, How did your mother inform you? She blushed, and interrupted me quickly. I have come to London to request you to interest yourself in favour of Admiral's children. The eldest is anxious to go to Bombay, and Mr. Canning, who has just been appointed Governor-General of India, is a friend of yours. He might take my son with him. I should be very much obliged. I would like to owe to you the success of my eldest child. She laid great stress on these last words. Ah, madam, replied I, what do you recall to me? What a reversion of destinies! You who received a poor exile at your father's hospitable table, you who have sympathised with his sufferings, you who perhaps may have entertained the idea of raising him to a glorious and unexpected rank. Is it you who are come to claim my assistance in your own country? I will see Mr. Canning, your son, whatever it cost me to give him that name, your son, if it is within my power, shall go to India. But tell me, madam, what effect has my new fortune produced upon you? How do you regard me at present? The phrase, my lord, which you employ, appears to me much too harsh, Charlotte answered. I do not consider you at all changed, not even grown old. Whenever I spoke of you to my parents during your absence, I always gave you the title of my lord. It seemed to me you ought to bear it. Were you not in my eyes as my husband, my lord and master? This graceful woman, as she pronounced these words, had something about her which reminded me of Milton's Eve. She was not born of another woman. Her beauty bore the impress of the divine hand by which it had been moulded. I hastened to Mr. Canning and Lord Londonderry, they raised difficulties about a petty place, just as would have happened in France. They promised, however, in such fashion as court promises are made. I gave an account of my progress to Lady. I saw her again three times. At my last visit she told me she was just about to return to Bungay. This last interview was mournful. Charlotte still talked to me of the past, of our retired life, our readings, walks, and music, of last year's flowers and the hopes of former times. When I knew you, she said, no one pronounced your name. Now, who is ignorant of it? Do you know that I have a work and many letters written by your hand? Here they are. She put a small parcel into my hand. Do not be offended if I do not wish to keep anything of yours. And she began to weep. Farewell, farewell, said she to me. Remember, my son, I shall never see you again, for you will not come to Bungay to see me. I will go, exclaimed I. I will go and bring your son's commission. She shook her head with an air of doubt and retired. Having returned to the embassy, I shut myself in my room and opened the packet. It only contained a few insignificant notes from me, and a plan of study, with some remarks on the English and Italian poets. I had hoped to find a letter from Charlotte. There was none. But I perceived on the margins of the manuscript some notes written in English, French, and Latin, of which the faded ink and the youthful writing testified that they had long since been placed on these papers. Such is the history of my acquaintance with Miss... Whilst finishing the relation, I feel as if I am a second time losing Charlotte, in this same island where I lost her the first. But between the feelings which I now experience towards her, and those entertained at the period the tenderness of which I recall, there is all the distance of innocence. Passions have interposed between Miss and Lady. I could no longer offer to an ingenuous woman the sincerity of desires, the sweet ignorance of a love bounded to the limits of a dream. 
I wrote then on the billows of sadness. I am no longer tossed on the sea of life. Well, had I folded in my arms as a mother and wife, her who had been destined for me when young and a bride, it could only have been with a sort of rage, to blot out, to fill with sorrow and extinguish, those twenty-seven years given to another, after having been offered to me. I must regard the feeling which I have just recalled as the first of that kind which ever entered my heart. It was, however, not at all in sympathy with my stormy nature. It would have corrupted it, it would have rendered me incapable of long enjoying holy delights. It was when embittered by misfortunes, already a pilgrim beyond the sea, and having begun my solitary wanderings. It was when the mad ideas described in the mystery of René took possession of me, and made me the most afflicted being on the earth, however that may be, the chaste image of Charlotte, by causing some rays of a true light to penetrate the depths of my soul, first dissipated a cloud of phantoms. My demon, like an evil genius, plunged again into the abyss. It awaited the effect of time in order to renew its apparitions. End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty four london april to september 1822 revised in december 1846 defect of my character my connection with m de boff on the subject of the essay sur les révolutions had never been entirely broken off and it was important to me to renew it as soon as possible on my return to london in order to maintain myself but what had been the cause of my last misfortune my obstinacy in keeping silence in order to understand this, some further knowledge of my character is necessary. Throughout my whole life, I have never been able to conquer that spirit of reserve and inward solitude, which prevents me from talking of what touches me most nearly. None could truly affirm of me that they have heard me relate what most people relate in a moment of sorrow, pleasure, or vanity. A name, a confession of any importance, never, or very rarely, falls from my lips. I never entertain casual acquaintances with my interests, my designs, my labours, my ideas, my attachments, my joys and my griefs, feeling convinced of the profound ennui we cause in others when we speak of ourselves. Although sincere and truthful, I am wanting in openness of heart. My soul has a constant tendency to shrink within itself. I stop in the middle of saying a thing, and these memoirs are the only faithful expression of my inward life. If I attempt to begin a narrative, the idea of its length suddenly strikes me with a fright, and after I have spoken a few words, the sound of my own voice becomes unbearable to me, and I am silent. As I have faith in nothing except religion, I mistrust everything. Malice and a disposition to taunts are the two characteristics of the French mind, mockery and calumny the certain result of any confidence. But what have I gained by my reserved nature? Because I have been impenetrable, I have become to others a sort of imaginary being, bearing not the most distant resemblance to my real self. Even my friends are deceived in me, while they think they are making me better known, and adorning me with the illusions of their attachment. All the mediocrities of antechambers, offices, newspapers, and coffee-houses have supposed me to have ambition, and I have none, cold and dry in ordinary foes. I have nothing of the enthusiast or sentimentalist about me. My clear and rapid perception quickly sees through a fact or a man, and despoils them of all importance. My imagination, far from carrying me away with it, or idealising applicable truths, swallows down the greatest events, baffles myself. The little and ridiculous side of things strikes me at first view. In my eyes great things or great geniuses scarcely exist polite, laudatory, and admiring in manner, towards the commonplaces which announce themselves as superior intelligences, my hidden contempt smiles and puts masks a la caillou on all these incense-breathing countenances. In politics the warmth of my opinions has never exceeded the length of my speech, or of my pamphlet. 
in my inward and theoretical existence i am a man of dreams in my outward and practical existence a man of realities adventurous yet calm and cool impassioned yet methodical there has never existed a being at once so chimerical and so positive so ardent and so cold a strange androgynous formed from the different qualities of my father and my mother the descriptions which have been given of me principally owe their utter want of resemblance to my chariness of words the multitude are too careless too inattentive to give itself time unless previously warned to know people as they are when i attempted to correct some of these false judgments in my professors i was not believed and at length as i was very indifferent on the matter i did not urge it and as you will has always freed me from the tiresome labour of convincing any one or seeking to establish a truth i return to my inward tribunal like a hare to its form and there give myself up to the contemplation of a moving leaf or a bending blade of grass i make no virtue of my circumspection invisible as it is involuntary if it is not a duplicity it has the appearance of one it is not in harmony with natures more happy more amiable more easy more naive more open and communicative than mine it has often done me injury in the minds of others and in matters of business because i never could endure explanations reconciliations and arrangements effected by protestations and clearings up lamentations and tears talk and reproaches details and apologies in the case of the family my obstinate silence with regard to myself was extremely injurious to me twenty times had charlotte's mother made inquiries respecting my relations and thus afforded me an opportunity to speak openly but not foreseeing the consequences of my silence i contented myself as usual with vague and brief replies had i not been under the influence of this odious perversity of mind any misunderstanding would have been impossible i should not have exposed myself to the imputation of having sought to abuse such generous hospitality the truth spoken at the decisive moment did not excuse me i had not the less been the cause of a real evil i returned to my work in the midst of my vexation and of my just self-reproach i even took a liking to my labour for the idea had occurred to me that by acquiring renown i should give the family less cause to repent the interest they had shown in me charlotte whom i thus sought to reconcile to me through fame presided over my studies her image was seated before me when i wrote when i raised my eyes from my paper i fixed them on the adored image as if its original had really been there the inhabitants of ceylon saw the sun rise one morning in unusual splendour its globe parted and a brilliant creature came forth who said to them i come to reign over you charlotte coming forth from a ray of light reign over me but let us quit these recollections they grow old and fade away like hopes the course of my life is about to change to flow into other valleys beneath other skies first love of my youth thou vanishest with all thy charms true i have but now seen charlotte again but after how many years of separation sweet light of the past pale rosy twilight which tinges the hem of night's robe long after the sun has set End of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred, part three, by Francois Rene de Chateaubriand. Chapter twenty five. London, April to September, eighteen twenty two. The essay historique sur les révolutions, its effect, letter from Lemierre, nephew of the poet. Life has often been represented, and I was one of the first to do so, as a mountain which we ascend on one side and descend on the other. It would be quite as correct to compare it to one of the Alps, with its bare brow crowned with eternal snow, and from which there is no descent. Following out this image, the traveller is always ascending and descends no more. He then has a better view of the space he has traversed, of the paths which he has not selected, and which would have led him by a gentler slope. He looks back with regret and grief on the point where he went astray. Thus the publication of the essay historique marks my first wandering step from the path of peace. I finished the first part of the great work I had traced out for myself. I wrote its last word between the idea of death, my illness had returned, and a vanished dream, 
insomnis venit imago conjugis the essay was printed by baylis and published by de boff in 1797 this date is that of one of the transformations of my life there are moments when our destiny whether yielding to society or obeying nature or whether it is then beginning to mould us into the form we are to retain suddenly changes its direction as a river alters its course the essay offers a compendium of my existence as poet moralist civilian and politician it is unnecessary to say that i hope for great success to this work as much at least as i could hope for anything we authors little prodigies of a prodigious era aspire to commune in spirit with future generations but i think that we do not sufficiently know the dwelling of posterity and put the wrong address on our communications when we stiffen in the tomb death will so unrelentingly freeze our words written and sung that they will not melt like the frozen words of rabelais the essay was designed to be a sort of historical encyclopaedia the only volume published is in itself a very extensive investigation i had the rest in manuscript next came after some researches and annotations of the analyst the lays and virilays of the poet the natures etc i can scarcely understand now how i could have carried on such extensive study amidst an active wandering life subject to so many vicissitudes my perseverance in labour explains this in my youth i often wrote for twelve or fifteen hours without moving from my seat striking out and recomposing the same page perhaps ten times age has in no degree weakened this faculty of application all my diplomatic correspondence is written by my own hand and yet it does not interfere with my literary labours the essay made a sensation among the emigres it was not in agreement with the feelings of my companions in misfortune my independence in my different social positions has almost always offended those in whose company i journeyed i have in turns been the chief of different armies the soldiers of which were not of my party i have led old royalists to fight for public liberties and especially for the liberty of the press which they detested i have rallied liberals in the name of this same liberty beneath the standard of the bourbons whom they hold in horror it so happened that the general opinion of the emigres was attached through self-love to my person the english reviews having mentioned me with praise this praise was reflected upon all the faithful i had sent copies of the essay to larbe ganguenet and de salle lemire the nephew of the poet of the same name and the translator of gray's poems wrote to me from paris july the fifteenth seventeen ninety seven that my essay had had the greatest success one thing is certain that if it was known for a moment it was almost instantly forgotten again a sudden shadow engulfed the first ray of my fame having almost become a personage i was sought by the emigres of distinction in london i moved from street to street first i quitted tottenham court road and settled myself in the hampstead road here i lodged for some months in the house of a mrs o'larry an irish widow the mother of a very pretty girl of fourteen and who had a great partiality for cats united by this similarity of taste we had the misfortune to lose two elegant kittens white as ermine with black tipped tails mrs o'larry's visitors were old lady neighbours with whom i was obliged to take tea in the old fashion madame de steel has described this scene in corinne at the house of lady engermond my dear do you think the water boils well enough to make the tea my dear i think it is a little too soon there came also to these tea-parties a tall handsome young irishwoman mary neale under the escort of a guardian she discerned some heart wound in my appearance for she said to me you carry your heart in a sling i carried my heart i know not how mrs o'larry left for dublin then always getting from the district of poor emigres in the east end i moved from lodging to lodging till i reached the district of rich emigres at the west end and took up my abode amidst the bishops the court families and the colonists of martinique pelletier had returned he had got married and was still the old boasting chatterer lavish of his complaisance and affecting the money of his neighbours more than their persons i made several new acquaintances especially in the circle where i had family connections christian de lamoignon who was severely wounded in the leg at quiberon and is now my colleague in the chamber of peers became my friend he introduced me to mrs lindsay who was attached to auguste lamoignon his brother le president guillaume was not made more of at basville between boileau madame de sevigne and bourdaloue than i was among these three friends mrs lindsay of irish family with rather dry wit temperament a little brittle elegant figure and pleasing face had great nobleness of soul and elevation of character the emigres of merit passed their evenings at the fireside of the last of the ninons the old monarchy was expiring with all its abuses and all its graces 
it shall some day be disinterred like those skeletons of queens decked with collars bracelets and earrings which are being discovered in etruria at this rendezvous i met m maluet and madame du Bellois, a woman worthy of esteem count montlosier and the chevalier de panat the last mentioned had a deserved reputation for talent untidiness in his person and epicureanism he belonged to that group of men of taste who formerly sat with their arms crossed before french society idle men whose mission was to see and judge everything they exercised the functions now performed by the newspapers without the harshness of the latter but also without their great popular influence montloisier had kept afloat on the fame of his renowned phrase of the croix de bois a phrase a little harshly treated by me when i reproduced it but true in the main on quitting france he went to coblenz ill received by the princes he had a quarrel fought one night by the banks of the rhine and was run through feeling unable to move and yet seeing no blood he asked the witnesses whether the point of the sword came out behind three inches replied they then it is nothing said montloisier sir draw back your thrust montloisier received in this way as the reward of his royalist sentiments crossed to england and took refuge in literature that great hospital for emigres in which i had a mattress near his he obtained the editorship of the courrier francais beside his newspaper he wrote physico-politico-philosophic works in one of these he proved that blue was the colour of life because the veins become blue after death life coming to the surface of the body to evaporate and return to the blue sky as i am very fond of blue i was quite charmed with this theory feudally liberal an aristocrat and a democrat a motley mind made up of pieces and fragments montlosier is very long in giving utterance to his out-of-the-way ideas but when he does succeed in bringing them to light they are sometimes fine and especially energetic an anti-priest as one of the nobility a christian from sophistry and as an amateur of antiquity he would have been under paganism a warm partisan of independence in theory and slavery in practice throwing the slave to the fishes in the name of the liberty of the human race a carper and caviller obstinate and rough the former deputy of the nobility of riom nevertheless permits himself to pay some court to power he knows how to take care of his interests but does not like or allow it to be perceived and shelters his weaknesses as a man behind his honour as a gentleman i have no wish to speak ill of my smoky auvergne with his romances of the mont d'or and his polemic treatise the plain i have a liking for his whimsical person his long obscure developments and circumvolutions of ideas with parentheses clearings of the throat and peevish oh oh annoy me anything dark and tangled misty and difficult to fathom is hateful to me but on the other hand i am diverted by this naturalist of volcanoes this failure of a pascal this gigantic orator who speechifies from the tribune as his little fellow-countrymen sing at the top of a chimney i like this gazetteer of turf pits this liberal explaining the charter through a gothic window this gentleman shepherd half married to his milkmaid sowing his barley himself amongst the snow in his little field of pebbles i shall always be grateful to him for having dedicated to me in his chalet at puy de dom an old black rock taken from a gaulish cemetery which he had discovered the abbe de lille another countryman of sidonius apollinaris of the chancellor of the hospital of lafayette thomas and chamfort driven from the continent by the torrent of the republican victories had also come to settle in london the emigres were proud to number him in their ranks he sang our misfortunes another reason for loving his muse he worked very hard indeed he was obliged to do so for madame de lille shut him up and did not set him at liberty till he had done his daily work of a certain number of verses one day i went to see him he kept me waiting a long time and when he did make his appearance his cheeks were very red people said that madame de lille used to box his ears of that i know nothing i only say what i saw who has not heard the abbe de lille repeat his verses he recited them very well his countenance ugly wrinkled and animated by his imagination was wonderfully suited to the coquettish nature of his delivery to the character of his talents and to his profession of abbe the abbe de lille's chef d'oeuvre is his translation of the georgics always excepting the pieces of sentiment but it is like reading racine translated into the language of louis the fifteenth the literature of the eighteenth century putting a few bright stars of genius out of the question standing as it were halfway between the classic literature of the seventeenth century and the romantic literature of the nineteenth though not without what is natural is wanting in nature devoted to the arrangement of words it is neither sufficiently original as a new school nor sufficiently pure as an antique school the abbe de lille was the poet of modern chateau 
as the troubadour was the poet of ancient ones the verses of the one and the ballads of the other give evidence of the difference which existed between aristocracy in its prime and aristocracy in its decrepitude the abbe describes readings and chess parties in the manor-houses where the troubadours sang of crusades and tournaments the distinguished personages of our church militant were then in england the abbe caron of whom i have spoken when borrowing the life of my sister julie from him the bishop of saint paul de leon a stern and narrow-minded prelate who contributed to make the count d'artois more and more a stranger to his contemporaries the archbishop of aix calumniated perhaps because of his success in the world and another learned and pious bishop but so avaricious that if he had had the misfortune to lose his soul he would never have repurchased it almost all avaricious men are men of talent i must therefore be very stupid amongst the french women of the west end was madame de boine amiable spirituelle full of talent extremely pretty and very young she has since in conjunction with her father the marquis d'osmond represented the court of france in england much better than such a savage as i she writes now and her talents will reproduce what she has seen with great cleverness Madame de Cormont, de Gonteau, and du Cluzel were also inhabitants of the quarter of fortunate emigrants, though I may perhaps be making a confusion with regard to Madame de Cormont and Madame du Cluzel, whom I had seen for a short time at Brussels. Certain it is that the Duchess de Duras was in London at this time, but it was not my fortune to become acquainted with her till ten years later. How many times in life do we pass by some object that would constitute its charm, as the navigator glides unconsciously over the waters which lave the shores of a land favoured by heaven and which he has only missed by a few miles or by one day's sail i write this on the banks of the thames and to-morrow a letter will go to madame durin on the banks of the seine to tell her that i have met with the first souvenir of her End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty six london from april to september eighteen twenty two fontaine clary from time to time the tide of emigration carried over to us companions of a new species and new opinions and different strata of exiles were formed the earth contains beds of sand and clay deposited by the waves of the flood one of these waves brought me a man whose loss i still at this time deplore a man who was my guide in literature and whose friendship constituted one of the honours as well as one of the consolations of my life in a previous part of these memoirs it has been mentioned that i had become acquainted with m de fontaine in seventeen eighty nine it was only last year in berlin i received news of his death he was born at New York of a noble Protestant family. His father had had the misfortune to kill his brother-in-law in a duel. Young Fontaine, having been brought up by a very deserving brother, came to Paris. He saw Voltaire die, and this great representative of the eighteenth century inspired his first verses. His poetical attempts were noticed by La Harpe. He undertook the composition of some pieces for the theatre, and formed a connection with Mademoiselle des Garcins, a delightful actress. He lodged near the Odéon, and wandering around the Chartreuse, he celebrated its solitude. He had met with a friend destined to become one of mine, M. Joubert. On the occurrence of the Revolution, the poet embraced one of those stationary parties which always perish, torn in pieces by the party in favour of progress which pulls it forward, or the retrograde which draws it back. The monarchists engaged M. de Fontaine as an editor of the Moderateur. When the evil days came, he took refuge in Lyon, and there married. His wife was confined of a son. During the siege of the city, which the revolution is called Commune Affranchie, as Louis XI, by banishing all the citizens, had called Arras Ville Franchise, Madame de Fontaine was obliged to remove her nursling's cradle, in order to shelter it from the shells. Being again in Paris, on the ninth Thermidor, M. de Fontaine joined M. de La Harpe and the Abbé de Vauxelles in establishing the Memorial prescribed on the eighteenth fructidor england became his harbour of refuge m de fontaine was with chenier the last writer of the classical school of the elder branch his prose and his poetry resemble each other and have merits of the same kind 
his thoughts and images exhibit a melancholy unknown to the age of louis the fourteenth which knew nothing but the austere and holy sadness of religious eloquence this melancholy was found mingled in the works of the author of the jour des morts as the impress of the period in which he lived it fixes the date of his advent and proves that he was born after j j rousseau and attached by taste to fenelon were any one to reduce m de fontaine's writings to two very small volumes one of prose and one of verse they would constitute one of the most appropriate funereal monuments which could be raised over the tomb of the classical school in the papers which my friend left were several cantos of a poem called la grèce sauvée some odes and various other poetical pieces he never however published anything for this critic so acute and lightened and when not influenced by political opinion so impartial had himself an extreme terror of criticism he was supremely unjust towards madame de steel an envious article of garras upon the forêt de navarre was intended to stop her short at the very commencement of her poetical career fontaine on his appearance destroyed the affected school of dora but he was unable to re-establish the classical school which drew near its close with the language of racine among the posthumous odes of m de fontaine there is one upon the anniversaire de sa naissance a birthday ode it possesses all the charm of the jeu des morts with a deeper and more individual feeling i remember only two stanzas la vieillesse déjà vient avec ses souffrances que m'offre l'avenir de courte espérance que m'offre le passé des fautes des regrets tel est le sort de l'homme il s'instruit avec l'âge mais que sont d'être sage quand le terme est si près le passé le présent l'avenir tout m'afflige la vie a son déclin et pour moi son prestige dans le miroir du temps elle perd ses appas plaisir allez chercher l'amour et la jeunesse laissez-moi ma tristesse et ne l'insultez pas could m de fontaine have felt an antipathy to anything it must have been to my manner of writing in me there began a complete revolution in french literature with the school called the romantic my friend however instead of rising in rebellion against my barbarism became a passionate admirer i noticed great admiration in his face when i read to him portions of my natchez atala and rene he found it impossible to reduce these productions to the common rules of criticism but he felt that he was entering into a new world he saw a new nature and comprehended a language which he was unable to speak i received excellent advice from him and to him i am indebted for all that is correct in my style he taught me to respect the ear he prevented me from falling into the extravagance of invention and the harshness of execution of my imitators it was a great pleasure to me to see him again in london fated by the emigres he was asked for cantos from la grèce sauvée and they pressed round in order to listen to him he took a lodging near me and we never quitted each other more we were present together at a scene worthy of those times of misfortune clary just lately landed read us his manuscript memoir judge of the emotions of an auditory of exiles listening to louis the sixteenth's valet de chambre relating as an eye-witness the sufferings and death of the prisoner of the temple the directory afraid of the effects of clary's memoirs published an interpolated edition of them in which the author was made to speak like a lackey and louis the sixteenth like a porter among all the examples of revolutionary baseness this perhaps is one of the foulest a vendean peasant m du the count d'artois agent in london hastened to inquire for m de fontaine the latter begged me to take him to the agent's house we found him surrounded by all the defenders of the throne and the altar who lounged about in piccadilly by a crowd of spies and pickpockets who had escaped from paris under different names and different disguises and with a host of belgian german and irish traders in the counter-revolution in a corner of the crowd stood a man about thirty or thirty-two years of age to whom no one paid attention and who himself paid attention to nothing except an engraving of the death of general wolf struck with his appearance i made some inquiries concerning him one of my neighbours replied he's nothing merely a vendean peasant the bearer of a letter from his chiefs this man who was nothing had seen the death of catalino the first general of la vendee and a peasant like himself of bonchamp the revived image of bayard of lescure armed with hair-cloth not proof against balls of delbet shot in his armchair 
his wounds preventing him from embracing death standing, of La Roche Jacqueline, the identification of whose dead body was ordered by the patriots in order to calm the fears of the convention in the midst of their victories. This man, who was nothing, had been present at the capture and recapture of two hundred towns, villages, and redoubts, at seven hundred skirmishes, and in seventeen pitched battles. He had fought against three hundred thousand regular troops, between six hundred thousand and seven hundred thousand conscripts and national guards. He had helped to carry off a hundred pieces of cannon and fifty thousand stand of arms. He had passed through the Colonne Infernal, companies of incendiaries commanded by conventionists. He had been in the midst of that ocean of flame, which on three different occasions rolled its waves over the woods of La Vendée, and finally he had seen three hundred thousand rural Herculeses, the companions of his labours, perish, and a hundred square leagues of fertile country changed into a desert of ashes. Old and young France met on this soil thus levelled by them. All that remained in France of the blood and remembrances of, of the Crusades struggled against all that there was in revolutionary France of new blood and new hopes. The conqueror was sensible of the greatness of the vanquished. Touro, the Republican general, declared that the Vendeans would be placed in history in the first ranks of a martial people. Another general wrote to Melan de Thionville, Troops which have beaten the French may well flatter themselves with being able to beat all other people. The legions of Probus in their songs said as much of our forefathers. Bonaparte called the battles of La Vendée battles of giants. In all this clamorous mob I was the only one to look with admiration and respect on the representative of those old Jacques, who in the reign of Charles V, whilst in the very act of shaking off the yoke of their feudal superiors, repelled a foreign invasion. He appeared to me like a son of those communes of the time of Charles the Seventh, who, united with the lower nobility of the province, reconquered the soil of France foot by foot and ridge by ridge. He had the careless air of a savage. His look was grim and inflexible as a bar of iron. His lower lip quivered against his closed teeth. His hair fell from his head like torpid serpents, but ready to resume their vigour. His arms, hanging by his sides, gave a nervous motion to his immense fists, covered with sabre-scars. He might have been taken for a sawyer. His countenance was that of an honest rustic nature, by the force of circumstances, put to the service of interests and ideas contrary to that nature. The native feudality of the vassal and the simple faith of the Christian were mingled in him with the rude independence of a plebeian accustomed to estimate and to do himself justice. The feeling of liberty seemed in him to be the consciousness of the power of his hands and of the intrepidity of his heart. He spoke no more than a lion, he scratched himself like a lion, gaped like a lion, threw himself on his side like a tired lion, and apparently to dream of blood and forests. What men of all parties were the French of that day, and what a race are we now! But the Republicans had their principle within them, in the midst of them, while that of the Royalists lay out of France. The Vendeans sent deputies to the exiles, the giants sent to ask chiefs from the pygmies. The rustic messenger at whom I gazed had seized the revolution by the throat and exclaimed, Come in, go behind me. It shall do you no harm, it shall not move a step. I have got it fast. No one wished to enter. Then Jacques Bonhomme let go his hold of the revolution, and Charette broke his sword. Wales with Fontaine. Whilst I was making these reflections on the sturdy Vendéen, as I had made those of another kind at the sight of Mirabeau and Danton, Fontaine obtained a private audience of him whom he pleasantly called the Controller General of Finance. He came out well satisfied with his interview. M. Dutay had given him a promise to encourage the publication of my works, and Fontaine thought only of me. There could not be a better man. Timid in everything which related to himself, but full of courage under the impulse of friendship, of this he gave me the best proof at the time of my resignation, on the occasion of the death of the Duc d'Anguin. In conversation he used to burst out into laughable fits of literary passion. On politics he talked nonsense. The crimes of the conventionalists had filled him with a feeling of horror for liberty. He detested journals, philosophizing, and ideology, and imparted the same feeling to Bonaparte in his intercourse with the master of Europe. We often went to walk together in the country. We used to stop under the shade of some of those large elms scattered about in the fields. Leaning against the trunk of one of these trees, my friend used to give me an account of his former travels in England before the revolution, and of the verse which he at that time addressed to two young ladies, now mouldering under the shadow of the towers of Westminster. 
tasks which he found standing as he had left them whilst the illusions and hours of his youth lay buried at their base we used to dine in some quiet tavern at chelsea on the thames and enjoyed ourselves with conversing on milton and shakespeare they had seen what we saw they had sat where we sat on the banks of the river to us a foreign but to them a native stream we returned to london at night by the light of the fading stars obscured one after another by the haze of the city we regained our home guided by the uncertain light which feebly traced out the way through the thickness of the smoke coloured of a reddish hue around each lamp thus flows on the poet's life we visited london in detail as an old exile i acted as cicerone to the new victims of exile young or old which the revolution demanded there is no legal age for misfortune during one of these excursions we were overtaken by a violent thunderstorm and obliged to seek for shelter in a shabby house the door of which happened accidentally to be open we there met the duc de bourbon at this chantilly i saw for the first time a prince who was not yet the last of the condes the duc de bourbon fontaine and myself were equally proscribed and in a foreign land obliged to seek for shelter under an humble roof against the same storm fata viam invenient fontaine was called back to france he embraced me with eager wishes for our next and early meeting when he reached germany he wrote me the following letter july twenty eighth seventeen ninety eight if you have felt any regret at my departure from london i assure you mine has not been less real you are the second person in whom during the whole course of my life i have met with an imagination and a heart completely to my taste I shall never forget the consolation which I have derived from you during my exile in a foreign land. My dearest and most constant thought since I took leave of you turn upon the Natchez. What you read to me, especially very lately, is admirable, and will never leave my memory. But the charm of all the poetical ideas with which you impressed me immediately fled on my arrival in Germany. The most dreadful news from France have followed those with which I made you acquainted on leaving you. I have been kept for five or six days in the most harassing anxiety in dread even of persecutions against my family my fears are to-day greatly diminished the evil has been but very slight the threat greater than the blow and the exterminators wish for people of a different date from mine the last courier has brought me assurance of peace and goodwill i can continue my journey and i propose to set out early in the ensuing month my abode will be fixed near the forest of st germain among my family greece and my books would i could also say the natchez the unexpected storm which has just burst upon paris has been caused i am certain by the blunders of the agents and chiefs with whom you are acquainted i have a clear proof of it in my hands on coming to this conclusion i wrote to great pulteney street where m du tay lived with all possible politeness but also with all that circumspection which prudence demands i wish to avoid all correspondence at least just now and i remain in the greatest doubt what i ought to do and what place of sojourn i ought to choose i still speak of you with the accents of friendship and wish from the bottom of my heart that any hopes of usefulness which may rest upon me may serve to keep alive those kindly feelings which have been ascribed to me and which are so fully due to your person and your distinguished talents work work my dear friend become illustrious and you can do so the future belongs to you i hope the promise so often made by the controller general of finance has been at least in part kept that part consoles me for i cannot bear the idea of a fine work being stopped for want of some pecuniary aid write to me let our hearts communicate and our muses be always friends be assured that as soon as i can go about freely in my native land i shall prepare for you a hive and flowers beside my own my attachment is unalterable i shall be alone as long as i am not near you tell me about your studies i wish to congratulate you on completing your work i have composed the half of a new poem on the banks of the elbe and i am more satisfied with it than with all the others adieu i embrace you tenderly and remain your friend fontaine fontaine informs me that he is composing verses on changing his exile a poet never can be deprived of everything he carries his lyre along with him leave the swan her wings every evening some unknown river will repeat the melodious lamentations which she would rather have sung on the eurotas the future is yours did fontaine here speak truly ought i to congratulate myself on his prediction alas the future there announced is now become the past shall i have another 
the first and affecting letter which i ever received from the first friend whom i had in my life and who since the date of that letter has walked twenty-three years by my side gives me mournful warning of my progressive isolation fontaine is no more deep sorrow for the tragical death of a son brought him to an early grave almost all those of whom i have spoken in these memoirs have disappeared from the stage of life and i keep merely an obituary register yet a few years and i myself condemned to catalogue the dead shall leave no one behind to inscribe my name in the book of the departed but if i must remain alone and none who love me shall survive to conduct me to my last asylum i have still less need than others of a guide i have examined the way and studied the places through which i must pass i have desired to see what takes place at the last moment oftentimes standing by the side of a grave into which the coffin has been let down by cords i have listened to the rattling of these cords then came the sound of the first shovelful of earth thrown upon the coffin at every succeeding cast the hollow sound diminished and the earth in filling up the grave by degrees caused eternal silence to ascend to the surface of the tomb fontaine you have written may our muses be always friends to me you have not written in vain End of chapter 26《Audiero nunquam tua verbo loquentem, nunquam ego te, vita frata amabili, aspiciam post hac, at certe semper amabo. Shall I speak to thee no more? Shall I never hear thy words? Shall I never see thee, O oh brother, dearer than my life? Ah, I shall ever love thee. I have just lost a friend, and am about to lose a mother. The verses addressed by Catullus to his brother are constantly applicable in our valley of tears as in the infernal regions there is the constant murmur of an eternal plaint forming the groundwork or principal note of human lamentations it never ceases and would continue should all created griefs be silent a letter from julie which i received a short time after that from fontaine confirms my sad remark on my progressive isolation fontaine urged me to work to become distinguished my sister begged me to give up writing altogether the one proposed fame to me, the other oblivion. You have seen in Madame de Farcy's history that such was the tendency of her ideas. She had conceived a hatred to literature because she regarded it as one of the temptations of her life. saint Servan, July 1st, 1793. My brother, we have just lost the best of mothers. It is with sorrow that I announce this severe blow. When you cease to be the object of our solicitude, we shall have ceased to live. If you knew how many tears your errors have caused our dear mother to shed, how deplorable they appear to any one of a thinking mind, to any one who lays claim not only to piety but to reason, if you knew this, it would perhaps help to open your eyes, to make you give up writing, and should heaven, touched by our prayers, permit us to meet again, you would find amongst us all the happiness that can be enjoyed on earth, and you would bring happiness to us, since none exists for us while you are absent and while we have reason to be uneasy on your account ah why did i not follow the impulse of my heart why did i continue to write had my writings never come to light would there have been any difference in the events or spirit of the century i had then lost my mother and i had embittered her last hour while she with her last breath was uttering a prayer for her only remaining son what was that son doing in london i was perhaps taking a walk on a fresh morning while the death damp was on my mother's brow and my hand was not there to wipe it away the filial tenderness which i had always preserved for madame de chateaubriand was very profound my childhood and youth were intimately associated with my mother's image all that i knew i had learned from her the idea of having poisoned the last days of her who had given me life threw me into despair i flung the copies of the essay with horror into the fire as the instruments of my crime if it had been in my power to annihilate the work i would have done it without hesitation I did not recover from this distracted state of mind until the thought occurred to me that I might expiate this first work by one of a religious character. 
such was the origin of the genie du christianisme my mother i said in the first preface to this work after having been thrown at the age of seventy-two into a dungeon where she witnessed the death of some of her children expired at length on a pallet to which her misfortunes had consigned her the thought of my errors greatly embittered her last days and on her deathbed she charged one of my sisters to reclaim me to the religion in which i had been educated my sister communicated my mother's last wish to me when this letter reached me in my exile my sister herself was no more she too had sunk beneath the effects of her imprisonment these two voices coming as it were from the grave the dead interpreting the dead had a powerful effect on me i became a christian i did not indeed yield to any great supernatural light my conviction came from the heart i wept and believed i exaggerated my fault the essay was not an impious book but a book of doubt and grief through the darkness of this work still gleams a ray of the christian light which beamed on my cradle no great effort was needed to return from the scepticism of the essay to the certainty of the genie du christianisme End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three by francois rene de chateaubriand chapter twenty eight london april to september eighteen twenty two genie du christianisme letter from the chevalier de panna when after the sad news of my mother's death i made a resolve instantly to change my course the title genie du christianisme which immediately occurred to me inspired me i set myself to the work and laboured with the ardour of a son erecting a mausoleum to his mother my materials had long since been collected and blocked out by my previous studies i was better acquainted with the writings of the fathers than people are in the present day i had studied them with the intention of combating them and having entered on the path with evil designs instead of vanquishing i had been vanquished as regarded history properly so called it had been the especial object of my attention during the composition of the essay sur les revolutions the camden papers which i had just been engaged in examining had rendered me familiar with the manners and institutions of the middle ages and finally my terrible manuscript of the natchez of two thousand three hundred and ninety three folio pages contained everything i needed in the way of natural descriptions i could draw largely from this source as i had already done in the essay i wrote the first part of the genie du christianisme the messrs dulot who had constituted themselves booksellers to the french emigrant clergy undertook the publication and the first sheets of the first volume were printed the work thus begun in seventeen ninety nine in london was not completed till eighteen o two in paris see its different prefaces a sort of fever preyed on me during the whole time of its composition none but he who has felt it can know what it was to bear atala and rene at one time in the brain the blood and the soul and to have added to the ideas of these twins of passion the labour of composing the other portions of the work the recollection of charlotte mingled as a warning ray with all my thoughts and to crown all the first desire for fame inflamed my heated imagination this desire was the result of filial tenderness i longed for fame that it might ascend to my mother's dwelling-place and that the angels might bring her my holy expiation as one study leads to another i could not occupy myself with my french researches without taking note of the literature and literary men of the country in which i was living i was drawn away into other researches my days and my nights were passed in reading writing taking lessons in hebrew from a learned priest the abbe capelon consulting librarians and well-informed people roaming in the fields indulging in my old habit of reverie and in receiving and paying visits if there are such things as retroactive and symptomatic effects of future events i might have augured the sensation to be caused by the work which was to make a name for me from the turmoil of my spirits and the palpitations of my muse some readings aloud of my first sketches served to enlighten me these readings are excellent as a mode of instruction so long as we do not take all the matter of course flatteries for genuine coin if an author is earnest and sincere he will quickly discover by the instinctive impressions of others the weak points of his work especially whether it is too long or too short whether it keeps to does not complete or exceeds the proper measure i find by me a letter from the chevalier de panna containing his opinion on the readings of a work then so unknown the letter is charming 
one would not have thought the positive and mocking spirit of the chevalier susceptible of thus meddling with poetry i do not hesitate to give this letter one of the documents of my history although it is filled with my praises from beginning to end as if the malicious author had found a pleasure in pouring out his whole ink-bottle over it monday mon dear with what an interesting reading have you indulged me this morning our religion had reckoned among its defenders great geniuses illustrious fathers of the church these giants had wielded all the arms of reasoning with vigour incredulity was conquered but this was not enough we yet needed to be shown all the charms of this admirable religion how fitted it is to the human heart and what splendid pictures it offers to the imagination here we have not the theologian in a school but the great painter and the feeling man opening to himself a new horizon your work was needed and you were called to produce it nature has eminently gifted you with the fine qualities required for this undertaking you belong to another age ah if truths of sentiment stand first in the order of nature no one has better felt those of our religion than you you have overwhelmed the impious with confusion at the very gate of the temple and introduced delicate minds and feeling hearts into the sanctuary you remind me of those ancient philosophers who gave their lessons with their heads adorned with chaplets of flowers and their hands filled with sweet perfumes and this is but a feeble image of your mind so sweet so pure so classic i congratulate myself daily on the happy circumstance which threw me into your society i cannot forget that it was a kindness done me by fontaine i love him the more for it and my heart will never separate two names which should be united in the same fame if providence ever reopens the gates of our country to us chevalier de panna the abbe de lille also heard some fragments of the work read he appeared surprised and shortly after did me the honour to put the prose which had pleased him into verse he naturalised my wild american flowers in his various french gardens and put my rather fiery wine to cool in the icy water of his clear fountain the unfinished edition of the genie du christianisme commenced in london differed slightly in the order of its subjects from that published in france the consular censorship soon to become imperial showed itself very touchy on the subject of kings their persons their honour and their virtue were dear to it beforehand fouche's police had already seen the white pigeon the symbol of bonaparte's frankness and revolutionary innocence descend from heaven with a sacred vial the sincere believers in the republican processions of lyon obliged me to cut out a chapter entitled the atheist kings and to scatter the paragraphs here and there throughout the work End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of the memoirs of chateaubriand seventeen sixty eight to eighteen hundred part three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Memoirs of Chateaubriand, seventeen sixty-eight to eighteen hundred, part three, by François René de Chateaubriand, chapter twenty-nine. London, April to September, eighteen twenty-two. My uncle Monsieur de Bedé, his eldest daughter. Before continuing my literary investigations, I must interrupt them for a moment to take leave of my uncle de bedet alas it is taking leave of the first joy of my life freno non remorant dies no rain can stay the flight of days see the old tombs in old crypts they themselves vanquished by time decayed and without memory having lost their epitaphs they have forgotten even the names of those they enclose i had written to my uncle on the subject of my mother's death he sent me a long letter in answer containing some touching words of regret but three-fourths of his double folio sheet was devoted to my genealogy he especially impressed upon me when i returned to france to seek out the documents and titles of the descent of the bedes entrusted to my brother thus neither exile nor ruin neither the destruction of his dearest friends nor the immolation of louis the sixteenth warned him of the revolution he was still in the days of the states of brittany and the assembly of the nobility this fixity of idea in a man's mind is very striking in the presence as it were of the decay of his bodily powers the flight of his years and the loss of his relations and friends on his return from emigration my uncle de bedet retired to dinan where he died within six leagues of montchois without seeing it again my cousin caroline the eldest of my three cousins is still alive she has remained unmarried notwithstanding several respectable proposals made when she was no longer young she writes me ill-spelled letters in which she calls me thou 
addresses me as chevalier, and speaks to me of the good old time, in illo tempore. She was gifted with fine black eyes and a pretty figure. She danced like Camargo, and thinks she recollects that I was desperately in love with her, though in secret. I reply to her in the same tone, putting on one side, after her example, my years, my honours, and my fame. Yes, dear Caroline, thy chevalier, etc., etc., it must be thirty or five-and-thirty years since we have met. Heaven be praised for it, for truly I know not what we should think of each other if we should happen to meet. Sweet, patriarchal, innocent, honourable family friendship, your age is past. We no longer cling to our native soil, by a multitude of flowers, branches, and roots. We are born and die separately. The living are eager to cast the deceased into the abyss of eternity, and to free themselves from the burden of his corpse. Of the friends, some follow the coffin to the church, grumbling meanwhile, at having their hours and habits deranged. Others carry their devotion so far as to follow the funeral procession to the cemetery. The grave once filled, all memory of the dead is effaced. You will never return, days of religion and tenderness, when the son died in the same house, in the same great chair, and by the same hearth, where his father and his grandfather died before him, surrounded, as they had been, with children and grandchildren in tears, receiving the last paternal benediction. Farewell, my dear uncle, farewell, maternal family, which is fast disappearing, like the other portion of my family. Farewell, my cousin of old times, who still love me as you loved me when we listened in company to my good aunt de Boitille's doleful history of the hawk, or when you were present at the performance of my nurse's vow at the Abbey of Nazareth. If you survive me, Accept the legacy of gratitude and affection which I here dedicate to you. Put no faith in the false smile faintly gathering on my lip while I speak of you. My eyes, I assure you, are full of tears. End of chapter 29for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Memoirs of Chateaubriand, 1768-1800, Part 3, by François-René de Chateaubriand, Chapter 30. London, April to September, 1822, revised in February, 1845. English Literature. Decay of the Old School. Historians, Poets, Civilians. Shakespeare. My studies, carried on in reference to the Génie du Christianisme, had by degrees, as I have already said, led me to a closer investigation of English literature. When I took refuge in England in 1793, I found that I must change most of the judgments I had drawn from critiques. Among the historians, Hume bore the reputation of a Tory and retrograde author. He, as well as Gibbon, was accused of having crowded the English language with gallicisms. Smollett, who continued his history, was a greater favourite. Gibbon, a philosopher during his life, become a christian at his death remained as such impeached and convicted of being a poor man robertson was still spoken of because he was dry as regarded the poets the elegant extract served as an exile for some pieces of dryden pope's rhymes found no pardon although people visited his house at twickenham and cut pieces from the weeping willow planted by his hand and withered as his fame blair was looked upon as a tiresome critic a la francaise he ranked much below johnson as to the old spectator he was laid on the shelf the English works on politics have little interest for us. Those on political economy are less circumscribed. The calculations on the wealth of nations, the employment of capital, and the balance of trade are in some degree of European application. Burke sprang from the national political individuality. In declaring himself an opponent of the French Revolution, he drew his country into that long career of hostilities which ended on the field of Waterloo. Still some majestic figures remained, Everywhere one met with Milton and Shakespeare. Did Montmorency, Biron, Sui, successively ambassadors from France, at the courts of Elizabeth and James I, ever hear of a strolling player acting in his own farces and in those of others? Did they ever pronounce a name so barbarous in French of Shakespeare? Did they suspect that there was in this name a glory before which their honours, their pomp and their rank would sink into insignificance? The actor playing the ghost in Hamlet was the great phantom, the shade of the Middle Ages, rising above the world like the star of night, at the moment when those Middle Ages had nearly disappeared among the dead, stupendous centuries, opened by Dante and closed by Shakespeare. 
in his memorials of english affairs whitelock who was a contemporary of the author of paradise lost speaks of him as a certain blind man called milton latin secretary to the council of state moliere the buffoon played his own Corsoniac, and shakespeare the mountebank made grimaces in his own falstaff these disguised travellers who come from time to time to sit down at our table are treated like common guests we remain ignorant of their nature till the time of their disappearance as they leave this world they are transformed and say to us as the angel said to tobit i am one of the seven spirits who stand continually in the presence of the lord but if they are mistaken by men in their passage these divinities never mistake one another milton felt sure that sweet as shakespeare fancy's child had no need of monuments in marble and brass to consecrate his venerated bones michelangelo envying the lot and genius of dante exclaims pour fusio tal per l'aspro esilio suo conserva tutte dare del mondo più felice stato would i had been such as he i would have given all the happiness of the world for his bitter exile together with his genius tasso celebrated camoens when he was still almost unknown and contributed to his renown there is nothing more worthy of admiration than this society of illustrious equals mutually revealing themselves by the signs of their genius addressing themselves to and conversing with one another in a language understood by themselves alone was shakespeare lame like lord byron walter scott and the prayers prieres the daughters of jupiter if it were so in reality the boy of stratford far from being ashamed of his infirmity like the author of child harold never hesitated to recall it to the mind of one of his mistresses lame by fortune's dearest spite shakespeare must have had many love affairs if we may reckon one for every sonnet the creating genius of desdemona and juliet must have grown old without any cessation of his attachments were the unknown women to whom he addressed his immortal verses proud and happy at being the objects of the poet's sonnets it may be doubted glory is to an old man what diamonds are to an old woman they adorn but cannot embellish her the great dramatist wrote to his mistress in the following strain no longer mourn for me when i am dead then you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that i am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell nay if you read this line remember not the hand that writ it for i love you so that i in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me then should make you woe oh if i say you look upon this verse when i perhaps compounded am with clay do not so much as my poor name rehearse but let your love ever with my life decay shakespeare loved but he believed no more in love than he did in any other thing a woman in his eyes was like a bird a breath of wind a flower something which delights and fleets away from indifference to or ignorance of his fame from his station which kept him apart from society or placed him beyond the reach of obtaining it he seemed to regard life as a lightsome leisure hour as a brief period of sweet enjoyment in his youth shakespeare met with some old monks driven out of their convents who had seen henry the eighth his reforms destruction of monasteries his court fools his wives mistresses and executioners when the poet died charles i was sixteen years old thus with one hand shakespeare had been able to touch the hoary heads that had been threatened by the sword of the last but one of the tudors and with the other the brown locks of the second of the stuarts which the axe of the parliamentarians was destined to bring to the dust resting upon these tragic supporters the great tragedian went down to the tomb he filled the interval of the days in which he lived with his spectres his blind kings the punishment of ambitious aspirers and women in misfortune in order by analogous fictions to connect the realities of the past with the realities of the future shakespeare is one of five or six writers who satisfy all the wants of the mind and furnish aliment to thought these maternal geniuses seem to have brought forth and reared all the others homer impregnated antiquity aeschylus sophocles euripides aristophanes horace and virgil are his sons dante was the parent of modern italy from petrarch to tasso rabelais was the creator of french literature montaigne la fontaine and moliere were his descendants england is all shakespeare and even down to the latest times he has lent his language to byron and his dialogue to walter scott the claims of these supreme masters are often denied men are guilty of rebellion against them their defects are reckoned up they are accused of ennui tediousness extravagance and bad taste 
even while men are engaged in plundering them and adorning themselves with their spoils everything springs from them their impress is everywhere to be seen they invent words and names which go to swell the general vocabulary of the people their expressions become proverbs their fictitious personages are formed into real ones who have airs and lineage they open up horizons from whence issue forth pencils of light they sow ideas which are the germs of thousands of others they furnish conceptions subjects and styles to all the arts their works are the minds or the exhaustless treasures of the human mind such geniuses occupy the first rank their immensity their variety their fertility their originality cause them from the first to be regarded as laws examples moulds types of different intelligences as there are four or five races of men from the same stock of which the rest are merely branches let us beware of insulting the irregularities into which these powerful beings sometimes fall let us not bring upon ourselves the curse of ham let us not laugh should we find the sole and solitary mariner of the deep naked and asleep under the shade of the stranded ark on the mountains of armenia let us respect this diluvian navigator who bore the seeds of a new creation after the cataracts of heaven were exhausted pious children blessed by our father let us cover him modestly with our mantle shakespeare while living never thought of living after his life what are my songs of admiration to him now admitting every supposition and reasoning after the truths or errors with which the human mind is penetrated or imbued what to shakespeare is a renown the fame of which can never ascend to him if a christian in the full enjoyment of the happiness of the eternal world would he be affected by the nothingness of the present if a deist disencumbered of the shades of matter and lost in the splendour of god would he humble himself to cast a glance upon the grain of sand whence he has passed if an atheist he sleeps the sleep without breathing or wakening which is called death nothing is more vain than glory beyond the tomb unless it has given life to friendship been useful to virtue lent seasonable aid to misfortune and it be granted to us in heaven to enjoy the consoling generous and merciful idea left by us on the earth End of chapter 30